This is way too long. That, it's way too long, that, 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 that sequence. It's too long. I'm so, <laughs> you don't have time to sit around watching graphics. That's not why you've clicked this. Uh, you've clicked it because of something in the title. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to put in the title. But uh, I wanted to make a video about, as ever, fascinated with uh, the the BBC. I'm not coming out the speakers, am I? Um, and they have appointed um, uh, Robbie Gibb, um, former Downing Street Communications Director. Now, I've been sort of following this chap's career ever since um, he was doing a uh, politics show. Um, and Amal, Amal Rajan uh, has written an article about him. Now, I find Amal Rajan particularly interesting because I've been also following his career, but I'm going to talk about him in a little bit. But let's just have a look at what the story is. So Robbie Gibb, former Downing Street Communications Director, joins BBC Board. Uh, so Robbie Gibb, a former Downing Street Communications Director, has joined the BBC Board uh, as the board member for England. He will start on 7th of May. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the BBC breaks up in terms of Wales and Scotland. Uh, but um, I don't know, is this a bad thing? Are we supposed to think it's a bad thing? He's prior to working at number 10 as the Conservative Party between 2017 and 2019, 17, 18, 19, three years. Gibb had successful 25 career, 25 year career at the BBC, culminating in his role um, uh, as head of Westminster. So he was deputy editor of Newsnight and editor of the Daily Politics in this week. That's right. That's what he did. And it was uh, in those latter capacities that Gibb worked closely with Andrew Neil. Now, it said that Gibb was kind of quite big in setting up the new Andrew Neil uh, news channel, GB News. Um, Gibb played an important role in the early stages of that project, um, but stood down as editorial advisor in October uh, that will be 2020. His main job was working as senior communications advisor uh, to the consultee of Keck CNC. I and Jewish Chronicle. He's now director of Jewish Chronicle. Supporter of Brexit. Uh, was in number 10 during uh, Theresa's May, Theresa May's, um, or Ter Theresa Dismay. <laughs> uh, critical supporter, uh, what's this? Since leaving Frontline Politics, Gibb has written several articles about impartiality of broadcasting. Can you see that? Let me just let me try and zoom this in for you. There you go. You're welcome. Uh, Radio 4's programme, a masterclass on why the BBC is losing the trust of his... Yeah, so he's starting to be quite critical of the BBC and its um, supposed lack of impartiality. Um which I would kind of agree with. And I think it's, I think the Newsnight thing is quite interesting because I think this all, the impartiality thing started happening when the BBC, BBC started seeing serious competition with the formation of channels like Channel 5 and Channel 4 doing really well. They were very edgy. They were breaking the rules. They were going by Ofcom, of course, but they were pushing it as much as they could. The BBC had always been quite stuffy. It kind of dominated the market. It could kind of it set its own rules. It didn't have any competitors. Um, and then when these channels came along, the BBC thought, well, we need to hire these executives and these producers. And Newsnight was one of those shows that got somebody in from, uh, I think they were Channel 4, is it Ian Katz? Channel 4, a Guardian, ex-Guardian as well. And he started seeing up Newsnight, and that's when we saw Paxman leave. So all the old schoolers started leaving. And ever since then, the um, <laughs> when, when I worked at the BBC, it was drummed into you to pay attention to the producer guidelines and the editorial guidelines about impartiality. And I thought we were pretty doing a good job, doing a pretty much good job. It was certainly doable. Um, and by the way, my mindset is not just news. My mindset is across the board of decision making from an editorial point of view. Um, for all sorts of programs, you know, I've worked on C here through to entertainment shows, through to music shows. So uh, my mindset is always about, am I being 100% impartial here? And that's a question you always ask yourself. But that question stopped being asked, I think, when the BBC started getting, um, feeling a little bit challenged uh, to viewers by the advent of all these new channels coming along. And I think that the new executive producers would come into the, um, come into the building and they would uh, 
go, I'm not bothered about these editorial guidelines. I'm going to go buy Ofcom's guidelines and what I've done before. I don't need a new set of guidelines set by the BBC. You're hiring me because I'm going to make this edgy. Um, and I think the BBC was quite conservative up to then, and then it started turning a little bit because it was all very Oxbridge. It was, you know, it was very sort of peers and, you know, Queen's English and all that. It was quite posh. And then it all started going the other way. Uh, because there was a push to get regional accents in, which is why they gave me a job, I was told. Uh, not better. Anyway, so I started reading this, and I got down to this bit where it said, um, and it made me stop. It's he, Amal Rajan, who works at the BBC. I'm going to go through his career in a second. But his appointment clearly strengthens the BBC's link, not just to Westminster, but the Conserv- Conservative Party. Specifically, now that seems like a, that's a whole paragraph he's put there, which seems like a pretty important paragraph in this piece because he's kind of implying there that um, the BBC is going to have strong links to the Conservative Party. Well, the BBC's kind of always got um, strong links to the government because the government pretty much appoints people. Um, so I thought. So I thought. Well, hold on. What's what's Amal Rajan's background because he has had an incredible career and it's credit to him for it. But um, let's have a wee look at. Let me find a picture of him. Here he is, Amal Rajan. Right, this is. Um, what's he do at the BBC now? Does it say? He's the media editor at the BBC, right? So this guy here, he's he's amazing. He was born 1983. Arrived in UK at three year olds. He was brought up in Tutin. He went to Graveney, Graveney school which is classed outstanding by Ofsted incidentally the same school as Naga Manchetti he uh he did an 18 gap year at the foreign and commonwealth office this guy's you know he's driven and by 2006 he was he was presenter and researcher of the right stuff age 23 on channel 5 uh, by 2007 he had joined the independent at the age of 24 he wrote for the Evening Standard. By 2013, he was editor of The Independent at the age of 31. Um, in September uh, 16th, uh, 2014, in the, in the Press Gazette, he said, I'm incredibly lucky <laughs> to be someone who was allegedly, although not quite, the first non-white person to have a job like this. But what any, But what anything I or my generation will achieve will pale in comparison to what my parents, who actually came from India, achieved. I find the idea that I'm some kind of ethnic minority ambassador or some sort of state school ambassador a bit weird. I just don't really think about all that stuff. I suppose I don't think about it because I don't think it's a huge, huge entrenched problem. That's interesting. There aren't a huge amount of brown or black or skinned, uh, brown or black skinned columnists, and I hope that changes. There aren't a huge amount of black or brown skinned columnists, and I hope that changes. But actually, that is changing slowly, so I feel pretty chilled out about it, really. Uh, that's not what you're meant to say, he adds. You're meant to say, it's a disaster. It's awful. Uh, that is what you're, mot- you're meant to say. Can you please go back to saying that? It's not okay. It's not actually fine. It's new- It's not a huge problem. You're supposed to say, it's a terrible problem. Uh, it's absolutely it's awful. There's no jobs. So this guy is... Um, Amazing. Look, in 2014, media advisor and uh, to the son of a Russian oligarch and former KGB attache. Uh, <laughs> this guy, who um, it, it was probably about the same age uh, as Emil Rajan. Uh, <laughs> by 2019, he was Radio 2 presenter. What has he done? So this is the guy, right? This is the guy writing the article flagging the appointments clearly strengthens, strengthens the BBC's links to not just Westminster, but the Conservative Party specifically. What were the BBC's links to Russian oligarchs? <laughs> or, uh, you know, they've all, they're all, these people are all interconnected. And you can choose to go down the route of thinking, oh, well, they are, um, you know, some sort of conspiracy going on here. They're all getting together and they're all working their networks down the clubs. And there's this idea in people's head they all folk, smoke big fat cigars and like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna manipulate all these people and are paying taxes and uh, you know we're in charge really? I don't quite think it works like that. Um, so. 
Robbie Gibbs going to be uh, moved up to be part of the BBC board, which got me wondering, well, what is actually the BBC board? Um, well, before I do that, uh, I just want to point out that there was a criticism of uh, journalists have betrayed their deals for the four of you stay. I thought this was quite interesting. This is a story that... Um, why did I flag this? Oh, I was trying to find the quote because um, this chap here, Peter Oborn, he used to be Telegraph journalist, quite um, senior, I think quite respected. I don't know much about him. I'm sure I can find out things about him. But can I just play this clip to you? Because he's talking about Oborn names and shames, BBC and TV journalists spreading fake news. This um, is from, I think it's 2019, and I think it's during Brexit. The old vote leave campaign, that a, a, a total unscrupulousness uh, has developed. And I would criticise um, a very large number of very senior British journalists, Laura Kunzberg, Peston, uh, the Daily names, Mail. Oh, no, it's important here, so... to name names. Oh, anyway, my own paper, the Daily Mail, the Mail on Sunday. And what they're doing is taking, passing on rub rubbish, very often, information much of it falls straight on, some, sometimes via Twitter, sometimes via their, uh, their own reports, which, many of, much of which turns out to be false. Well, you see, I mean, Robert Peston has replied to you, and he, he said I, I, it's his him. job to, to, to draw back the veil yeah. and to report things that are said to him. Now, and and th that makes us all the wiser. Yeah. The, the problem, though, here is that instead of doing the job of a journalist, which is to interrogate in a in sceptical way the information you're getting from a number 10 Downing Street, what they are actually doing is just shoveling it on unmediated. And the if, 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 if politicians learn that what that journalist jobs are just as um, he described, which is to pass on anything they're told, then then politicians politicians can just tell them garbage. And then have much to their amusement as they try and figure out what was meant by it. Well, it all depends which way the chicken swings. Oh, Boris Johnson talks about chickens. Front page, front page, talk about chickens. It's like, let's get them talking about chickens. You know, you can pretty much say anything you want to journalists, according to this guy from Channel 4 News. And um, I think it's bonkers. Here's a radio interview between Amal Rajan, when Amal Rajan used to work at Radio BBC Radio 2, and the criticism is that um, Amal Rajan, who has just flagged, by the way, that Robbie Gibb, it's a big deal, his appointment clearly strengthens BBC's links not just to Westminster, but the Conservative Party specifically. This is what uh, the same chap, Peter Oborn, uh, says to Amal Rajan. Our journalist, I'll name a few, Beth Rigby. There we go. Uh, there are journalists, I'll name a few, Beth Rigby of Sky News as a proper job. She's properly sceptical. Louise Goodall of Sky News, properly sceptical. But uh, uh, too many of them, and that includes, I'm afraid, Luna, your, your own Lorna Koonsberg, just pass it on. And that enables... That, that enables no, I, think that's, I think that's out of order. You know, I think is that's absolute, of, look, I'm just flagging that it was, it was perfectly in order when he was talking about Sky, uh, Sky News, his editors... But now he's talking about BBC. It's like, oh, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I think it's out of order. You, were think, a you yourself, when you were independent, independent editor, were no, notoriously sucked up to power. You are a client journalist yourself. And, um, well, Pops, uh, what evidence have you got for that? I, for, I followed your career. What evidence have you got for what that? About a, which were your years in um, uh, independent? Peter, it's, it's, it's unbecoming I know, of you. It's unbecoming look, of you. I know, you are a crony to... journalist yourself. It's time this system was exploded. Have you got any evidence for those assertions? Yes, I'll send you a... Don't worry, I've got plenty of now. evidence. We haven't got any evidence now. So you can come All right, on. why did You're the invite... independent... Hang on a second, You're, hang on a second. You're invited onto Wait, Which year did you end on? You're, in... which You're was... invited onto well, Radio 2. I'll give Radio you an example of... Yeah. ..to talk about some broad issues, which we allow you to do in a constructive and intelligent way. And instead of... I have to say something to that. We invite you on to talk about issues in a broad an intelligent way, which we allow you to do. It's, it's, it's like people should be grateful to, I don't know, the tone of that and the perspective of that is a bit squiffy. I'll play on just because it's only, it's only a few, um, it's only 30 seconds more. And I think it's quite a juicy little interview. Sorry for interrupting it. Talking about the broad thematic issues, you go into a series of attacks. 
I'm not going to try and defend other colleagues of mine. Laura Koonsberg can defend herself and indeed has done and has probably the hardest job in the history of political journalism. But to say, to come on the show and say, you're a client journalist, a crony journalist because of the independent... You were notorious that you were Lebedev. I mean, the questions which were not asked about your owners during that time. Right, that's, he's talking about Lebedev there, who is who I mentioned before, this guy, Lebedev. He worked for uh, the son of a, a, a former KGB. You know, any sort of Russian links are going to get you into sort of trouble water. And I think the conspiracy theorists start going a bit crazy. And I think that Peter Oborn could very easily be criticised for being a bit that way right now in this interview. But, you know, this is what Amal Rajan is doing towards um, uh, Sir Robbie Gibb getting a on the BBC board. Um, Amal Rajan is sort of implying that there's close links to the government and that can't be a good thing. Um, um, that I'm afraid it's a real problem. Talking about politics, You've got a lot of questions, and it was you who started this. You have a lot of questions to ask about your own political career and your reporting uh, as a media commentator for the BBC while, while you're at it. Look, the stories you've failed to notice. Let's go back to the broad issue. Let's go back to the broader issue. Let's go back to the broader issue, which is the BBC board. So I'm just going to wrap this up because this has gone now, on for... A bit of a cliche oh, oh, hello. Oh, it's, hello. 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 Oh, bless him. I'll just leave that there, I think. No one. Uh, I wanted to... Shut up. Uh, there was <laughs> the BBC board. Let's just talk a little bit about what the BBC board are and what they do. The board is responsible for ensuring... Uh, let me see if I can zoom this in so you can actually read it. Can you see that? Uh, the board is responsible for ensuring uh, they deliver their mission on per- public purposes. It does this by setting strategic direction, creative remit, budget, framework for assessing performance, framework for ways in which the BBC must handle complaints, bold and a link. Uh, the policy on distribution of U- uh, UK public services, strategy of governance arrangements, blah, blah, boring, boring. Uh, they must uphold and protect the independence of the BBC and make its decisions in the public interest. It is accountable for all of our activities, including the public funded services and our commercial activities in the UK and around the world. The board demonstrates we are meeting our obligations through the publication of two key government's documents, the annual plan and the annual report accounts, which is my favourite documents that get released every year. The board has delegated some of its functions to a number of committees. And then it goes on about the members, and here they are. Now, I've done a little, because um, I'm a nice guy. Look what I did. I made a little, uh, <laughs> a little breakdown of who they are. So uh, these p- people come and go. Uh, but I'd go f- I thought I'd go through them to see just you know, how corrupt are they. And we got like this guy here who's Boris's mate. Uh, we got this uh, Tim Davies, the direct- director general, um, the DG. Uh, he's been BBC for life. I think a good egg. Um, this is Ellen. She's uh, a media person for life from Wales. Uh, good egg. Uh, Shirley Garud. Uh, she's a finance person, so she'd be good for the budget side of life. Good egg. Um, uh, Tanya Gray Thompson's a Paralympian. Um, knows what she's doing. Knows what she's talking about. Uh, Ian Hargreaves. Um, What's I say? Ex BBC News used to be the boss of BBC News. Knows what he's talking about. Knows the the the, the thing inside out. Probably old school. Uh, Tom Lube. Uh, he's the boss of Lube at the BBC. No, he's not. He's a technical person. He he did um, egg the credit card egg. He's sort of I think he's the founder of that or something. And he's kind of like a you know technology guy. Uh, so he's definitely going to have sound input. Uh, on the board, Charlotte Moore, she's BBC born and bred, BBC One controller, just has made and been responsible for lots of fantastic commissions for the BBC. Um, Steve Morrison, he's from independent sector, all three media, knows about audiences, I would have thought, knows about um, production and staffing and what makes a successful TV company thrive. Uh, Nicholas Sarota, he's an art historian, uh, by trade, kind of interesting. I'm not quite, you know, I don't know too much about him. Uh, Lee Tavaziva, ex-ballerina, 
Um, and she's kind of like a, like a, a businessy person. Uh, she used to work at British Gas and very high up senior, uh, high end business strategies, things like that. And then you got Francesca Unsworth, who's a BBC lifer. Interestingly, not a Twitter user. And I don't think many of these guys are, but I know that Francesca's Twitter account is pretty much redundant. She doesn't involve herself in that world, which I think is something everybody should do uh, if you work for an organization. Um, so I just wanted to flag uh, that, do a little breakdown there of who these BBC uh, people are, and and then just to, just to try and um, get people out of this mindset that there is this big corruption thing going on, and that there is it's jobs for the boys or anything like that. I don't think it genuinely is. I'm not one of these uh, defund the BBC people. Um, I am. I don't have a TV license. I object to. Uh, how the BBC is going at the moment. Uh, I think it needs to step right back, almost get back to basics. <laughs> That's a good phrase. They could use that. And I think Robbie Gibb is probably a good call just because he is critical of the BBC and the impartiality issues. And what needs to happen, and I think it's already happening with the appointment of um, of Tim. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten his blooming first name already. Tim Davy. Uh, just with his appointment and him uh, talking about social media and how be careful staff, how you use and presenters, how you use social media. People are already sort of checking themselves and be careful what they say and do. And that's a good thing. Um, the main problem within the BBC is not just the news people being either right wing or left wing. It's to do more with uh, the culture within it of who is being employed. And because there's such a big push to get regional accents in there and we get people from sort of comprehensive schools or, you know, universities from up and down the country, not just Oxford and Cambridge, because that's happening, um, you're tending to find that, that, that generally, and I mean like super generally, maybe like 40, 60, 60, 40, something like that, but generally it leans towards the left, but only because that's how universities are. That's what student unions are. That's what you are when you're young. You're a big lefty in the world. The world's real simple. Money isn't, you know, you don't, you, you, you slowly when you get into your 30s, you start becoming a bit more right wing at 40s maybe. Uh, and that's kind of like how things tend to work. Unless you're an activist and then you're just never going to change your mind. Um, so I think the BBC needs to try and find people who are a bit more centrist, uh, who aren't activists in any manner, form, or, or, or I've never demonstrated any activism, um, and just be very, very careful about a more, yeah, careful in the selection process, and that needs to be monitored much, much more, and not just within the doors of the BBC, but within the doors of all the independent production companies that the BBC are using, because they have to use them. They have to hire, uh, they have to outsource stuff to production companies, which is why they got rid of so many staff, producers and directors, like me. Um, because that's what has to happen. So now all those producers and directors that the BBC got rid of are now working for independent production companies at twice the, the rate that the BBC paid them. And the BBC is then you know, paying money on top of that for them, probably. So it's ended up more expensive. So um, that's... Just a comment I wanted to make about Sir Robbie Gibb becoming um, on part of the BBC board. It's a good appointment, and I'm pretty ha happy myself in how the BBC board is constructed. I've got faith that these people know what they're doing. Uh, and just because the BBC board changes, the whole culture of the BBC won't change just overnight like that. It has to be a, a slow process that needs to go back to training people, not just teaching young people how to point a camera and you know and to self-shoot you need to learn about um, editorial you need to learn about journalism you need to learn about how you how you conduct interviews you need real skills and abilities multi-camera directing production-based stuff I know there's a bunch of people who are are also really important in terms of managing budgets and production management things like that those are other things and important areas too but I think in terms of the creative aspect of the BBC, uh, that's where the focus needs to be, finding and sourcing new producers, um, cutting right back on what you pay presenters, cutting back on regional radio stations or re re regional buildings and infrastructures that uh, you just can't afford anymore. Um, you know, do you really need a Radio Sheffield and a Radio Leeds and a Radio Humberside and a Radio Lincolnshire? And, a, you know, a, you know why, why have we got... Why is there so much overlap going on? 
Anyway, what do you think? The BBC board, Robbie Gibb, good appointment, bad appointment, let me know. Uh, are you um, up for defunding the BBC? Do you, do you, are you like me, which is you want it reformed? Because I think it is uh, potentially the could, could be, again, a world-class broadcaster, the envy of the world. At the moment, I think it's a bit of a laughing stock, although it's still very popular and the go-to source for trusted news. Uh, I think it could. Uh, I think it is a, a little bit of a laughing stock. Um, the BBC license has to go. People shouldn't be forced to the threat of um, criminality for not paying their TV license. That just is not in step with how we operate now. You don't need a TV license. You can be just as entertained on here on YouTube or on Twitch or uh, any other sort of platform you want. People, you know, look, look at me. Look, look, look what I'm doing right now. Sorry, here we go. Look. I can sit here and make this and switch between cameras, look. I can do my own little TV studio here at home. I don't, we don't need BBC television centre anymore. So um, that's it. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. Uh, as ever, really appreciate your time and your energy. Like, subscribe, comment, and um, I'll see you again next time. I've been Craig. This is Flooded. Goodbye. And we have to keep the video running here so that I can put a couple of boxes in at the bottom advertising other videos you might want to watch. <laughs>